All right, Brian, hit and go live. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Ask Me Anything, um, sponsored by the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My name is Brian Sturm. I am the Associate Dean for Academics here at the university and uh, at the school. And um, I have three panelists to, uh, to share information with you today, um, Megan Winget and Ron Berquist and Helen Thibault. Um, I want to say thank you all for joining us today um, on this edition, and um, we do have some pre-submitted questions, but if you have questions as you listen for these panelists, please use the description box um, in the YouTube channel on the YouTube window to submit those questions, and I will try to bring them into the conversation as best I can. So we'll pause just a moment as we transition to our first panelist, who will be Dr. Megan Winget. Hello, Megan, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Brian? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us here. Um, we are, um, as, I, as I said previously, we have a few questions um, that have been asked, pre-submitted. Um, and then as, uh, as the listeners and viewers um, hear your, your presentation and our conversation, um, hopefully we'll get some, some others added there. Um, okay. But can we, can we start with just a, I mean, I'd like to let you introduce yourself. So um, if we can start with that, and then I'll get into my first question. Sure, uh, I'm Megan Winget. I got my doctorate here at UNC and my master's degree at SILS. And uh, I taught at the University of Texas for seven years and then worked in uh, private industry for about eight years. And then I came back uh, to be a teaching assistant professor here. So I'm a teaching prof assistant professor and I teach uh, the required courses of perspectives and ethics, and I also teach organization of information. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the first question um, is, is really fairly broad, um, mm -hmm. so take it where you wish. Um, it's basically, you know, what are, what are you working on? What are the academic interests you have? Um, what are your sort of plans for, the, for down the line? Okay. Yeah, so this summer I, I took a step back and decided that I wanted to start taking advantage of my teaching professor status and do projects that I think are interesting or engaging or useful rather than thinking primarily about what I can publish as research. These projects that I'm going to describe might lead to research that I can publish, but the goal really is to generate linkages between SILs in the university and the Chapel Hill Carborough community with most of my projects. So the first one is um, the On the Books Research Fellowship that I just got. Uh, the On the Books Project is a Mellon-funded grant uh, funneled through the university libraries. Um, and essentially what they're doing is they're using machine learning to identify Jim Crow laws that are on the books in North Carolina state law books. So my project, and I'm working with a woman named Danita Mason Hogans, who runs a nonprofit called Bridging the Gap. And Bridging the Gap aims to improve the educational opportunities for descendants of the enslaved in Chapel Hill and Carborough. So our project is to have the James Kate scholars who are uh, a summer program that Danita runs through Bridging the Gap, they're high school students, uh, will have the James Kate scholars collect oral histories from community residents uh, about their experiences with Jim Crow. We'll make those oral histories available through the Southern Oral History Program and create a website to house the oral histories as well as visualizations of the data. We're going to use those narratives to provide a check against the data generated by the On the Books problem, uh, project. So essentially, people will be telling us narratives about their experiences. We'll identify uh, stories where there's a law involved or what, what people think is a law. And then... Um, and then check, use that to check against the data that the On the Books project has developed. 
So the laws that the narrators are going to provide probably aren't going to be on the books. Um, so for their data set right now, there are only four laws identified in Orange County. Three of those have to do with school segregation and one uh, with the last one having to do with um, moving a cemetery for enslaved people in Hillsborough. So uh, what I'm going to do is develop a language to describe the oral history narratives in a way that will hopefully improve the model for the next iteration of this project, the On the Books project in Virginia and South Carolina, and uh, develop a descriptive language to help legal scholars look up and research these laws in the future. So those are the obvious results of the project, right? The oral histories of underserved and ignored communities in the Chapel Hill Carboro region, uh, giving high school students opportunities to do some serious university level research and developing the descriptive language. But the additional outcome um, and something that might be just as valuable as that other stuff, but less easily measured is going to be a model for how a large institution like UNC can work with a small community without being extractive and exploitive. So the example that I, I like to give in this situation is that in the 90s, I, I might be getting the date wrong, um, someone in the educational community, either at Duke or UNC, collected oral histories of local civil rights leaders. When my partner, Danita Mason Hogan's my partner in this project, went to listen to the recording of her own father, uh, as a non-UNC affiliated community member, she was asked to pay $10 to get access to this resource. This is a resource that was made possible and came from her community. Mm -hmm. So the model of a faculty member going into a community, extracting the knowledge or the expertise or the lived experience of the people in those communities, and then leaving the community with nothing is coming to an end. Uh, the communities themselves are less likely to uh, get involved with that kind of research. And I'm hoping that by mindfully working through this project with this exploitive history in mind, we will be able to provide a new model for town and gown collaboration. So that's the one big project that I actually have money to work on. Um, have any questions come in regarding that? Um, no, none yet, but um, okay. can, I, can I pursue sure. one thing there? Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea of including the high school students, mm -hmm. um, can, can you explain sort of what the, what the rationale was there? Uh, well, it's, it's part of this model of trying to uh, have a closer collaboration between the organization, the large organization being UNC in this case, and a smaller organization. So we want to give the high school students who come from underserved communities the opportunity to feel more comfortable on campus and mm -hmm. to um, have a better understanding uh, of the processes that people go through when they're conducting research. And also it's an opportunity for them to talk to people in their community, elders in their, so it'll be an intergenerational um, interviewing process. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's a good way to, to get them um, thinking in terms of historical context. Yeah, no, I, th I think it, it accomplishes so many things. Um, mm -hmm. As you say, the, the sort of intergenerational uh, conversations, mm -hmm. um, getting the getting the young people in touch with people they they may know of in their community but not know. Mm -hmm. um, so forging those connections actually within the community, and um, and then this this sense of uh, of a of sort of a, almost a feeder project mm -hmm. into um, thinking about university and the kinds of interactions you can have. There. Uh, that's fabulous. Really, yeah, really, yeah, really cool. Yeah, I'm excited about starting it in October. Yeah. And, so then, uh, oh, sorry, huh? go ahead. So I have other projects with Bridging the Gap that um, are, are not funded. Um, maybe they will be eventually, but one of them is uh, James Cates Records Project. So James mm -hmm. Cates, for those of you who don't know, is a man, a black man who was murdered in the pit, which is in front of the student stores in 1970. And um, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who've done research around this, like people who've tried to write books about this Pro, this this incident, and there just aren't any records. There are very very few university records about this this incident. Although it happened on university grounds, it was in relationship to a university sponsored event. Uh, that there were protests, big protests on campus. It's just very uh, mysterious about where the records are. So what I want to do is uh, sort of strategically think about where we might be able to find records, and look through the records and develop a live guide or finding aid to uh, help people who are interested in this particular research project. I'm not sure how easy that project's going to, I mean, I think it's going to be a hard project, but um, the, 
Department of Justice has just reopened the James Cates case. It was a cold case. They've just reopened it because I think they too are very confused about why there aren't any records. So I don't know if we would be working against the Department of Justice or with the Department of Justice, but um, so th that's a project that uh, Danita has expressed interest in. Another project is Fair Housing Act records uh, uh, in the university archives and the town of Chapel Hill archives. So when the Fair Housing Act was, there are a number of Fair Housing Acts. I think there was one in 1953 and then 68 and maybe 74. Um, if, if something in Chapel Hill wasn't owned by an individual, it was owned by the town or the the university. And so I think that being able to look at those records, again, there isn't any kind of resource for where to find this stuff, um, will be interesting in terms of housing equity and uh, the ways in which the law was enacted in our particular town and the role that the university played. So that's another records project where I just want people to go into the records and, and find them and create some sort of finding aid or live guide. Mm. And then finally, uh, I want to, in collaboration with Danita at Bridging the Gap, is uh, develop a fundraising workshop for leaders of underserved communities in the Triangle and Triad. Uh, so it would it would include things like how to write grants or some grant writing tips, um, social fundraising, like best practices for Kickstarter or Go GoFundMe, and then developing boards that can help with community gifts and whatnot. So um, those are three other projects that I'm interested in in terms of bridging the gap. Any questions about those? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> hang on a moment. I think someone is typing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let me see what, what comes through. And for all of those, I need help with those. Uh, so for the, on the books, I, I'm funded um, tiny, tiny bit of funding, but it's still funding. And, and we have a project plan in place. The other ones are more nebulous mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. at this point. But what, one of the interesting things I think is that um, with our new curriculum, um, mm -hmm. we have this practicum at the right. end. Um, and uh, you came to the practicum development class and, and sort of mm -hmm. pitched these ideas as well. And there was a lot of interest from the students. Um, right. We haven't actually formed those committees yet or those groups to work on projects, but in, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing that. But Yeah, I, I um, hope somebody signs up for them. Yes, yeah, no, I do too. I think that would be great. Um, and then I have a project that I haven't even announced to anybody yet. It's because I don't know how to go forward with it. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a student project. Um, and it's called the Protest Banner Workshop. So I envision it as a semester long project that I do every semester. So we would choose a protest movement, like one protest movement per semester. That could be on campus, like the food worker strike of 1972 or a national protest or an international protest and do archival research to find samples of protest banners or signs that these people used. Choose some that are particularly powerful for whatever reason, like they're powerful phrases or images or they're still relevant today and recreate those banners, uh, straight recreation if, if it's still a relevant topic, which in most cases it is, unfortunately. And then at the end of the semester, have a banner ceremony where we take out the banners that we made that semester and parade around campus. <laughs> I really love this idea. Um, so I want to use these banners to create a collection of protest banners that people could check out for their own purposes. And um, I haven't made an announcement to Sills yet because I, I'm having trouble really conceptualizing how to make this happen. <laughs> like, do we meet sometimes in person and sometimes on Zoom? And what day do we all meet? Like, it's just too much for me. I would really like it if somebody could collaborate with me on how to like make that, that all work out. But I think it would be a really fun project yeah. and relevant for our, our students. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the idea that it's a, you know, you're, you're building a collection, but a, a very unique kind mm -hmm. of collection. Yeah, uh, I've seen other, other places have done this, not, not schools, but um, other people have, have built these protest banner collections okay. uh, that seem fun. Yeah. yeah. So how would you, how would you go about uh, just theoretically, how would you go about choosing which ones? Would that be sort of student driven or? I guess it would be student driven. Yeah. yeah. We would have to decide as a group what protest movement to focus on each semester. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, 
do some research and find the images of the banners and signs and then decide which, I mean, each person could make their own sign or we could work as a group to make a few really big ones or like, I'm not really sure we would have to talk about it, but I'm hoping that just by, by putting it out into the world now, like (laughs) I have to, uh, like, I have to make it happen. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So did you speak it? You've got to follow up, don't you? (laughs) Yeah, no, that sounds like a really fun project. And, yeah, um, I could I could see a lot of our students not only being able to employ their their sort of information library seeking skills in mm-hmm. that, um, but also learning something about history and um, yeah. and, and advocacy, mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. which I think is is increasingly going to be part of the LIS curriculum in terms of what our students need to be learning and learning how to do. Right. Right. Um, so that's great. Um, and then there were other questions about um, the digital media preservation stuff that I that yeah. I used to do, and um, I just wanted to say that um, I don't really I I don't do that anymore. I don't do research on digital preservation or game preservation um, because mostly because those are really big projects, and I would need to write grants. And I'm a teaching professor. I don't I don't write big huge grants. Right. Um, but. Uh, there are still things that are really interesting to me about this topic. So the interesting thing to me is the idea of preserving something that constantly changes and where the essential properties are difficult to define precisely and -hmm. where the meaning of the thing changes over time, given different perspectives. So Mm -hmm. like, I think the questions are this very much the same for things like digital media, including video games and digital art, Uh, just plain old normal dance theater and performance art, like no digital involved. And then also political movements, ephemera, like the Lenin wall in Prague. And there's also one in Hong Kong, like how do you preserve, what what is that thing that you're preserving? And then also protest banners would be another example of this. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of those different cases, community involvement is the driving force behind any kind of successful preservation of these kinds of materials. So in the end, like really all of it for me is about building community and using the community, your community to get the important work done. So yeah, that's, it's all really about community for me. So the projects that I'm trying to develop are like focused on community building and sort of formalizing that in a, in a productive way. Mm-hmm. Way to way. Yeah, no, those are, those are fabulous projects. Thank you for sharing them. We're, we're running out of time. So okay. uh, I will, uh, I'll say thank you. Uh, again thank you for, for joining us. And um, we'll transition over to our next panelist, who is um, Ron Burquist. Hello, Ron. How are you doing today? Not too terrible. Okay, great. I like the fact that we both have books in our backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, we both have the same shirt. We must have gotten the uniform. The, That's uh, right. Yeah, we, we, we both got the memo, right? right. Um, so, um, Ron, would you uh, introduce yourself as well, please, to our viewers? Uh, I'm Ron Berkwith. I am, as Megan is, uh, a teaching professor here at uh, SILS. And like Megan, I got both my uh, MSLS and uh my PhD here at SILS. Unlike Megan, I stayed here and Megan went out and did things and then then thing came back. So we're back, we're back in the same orbit again after uh, after a number of years. So kind of a second career for me because I began in this uh, field when I was 50 years old. So uh, just different uh, space that I'm in. But uh, I've got some things Megan said uh, kicked off some thoughts uh, for me as well. So as we have this conversation, I, I hope to bring them in um, and, and how they relate together. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so again, that, that first question, very broad. Um, what are you sort of currently working on or thinking about or what is what has captured your attention right now? Well, um, let's skip over the first part of the question and go to the second part of the question. Okay. What captured my attention right now is Megan's working with the community on a particular topical area. And just within the past month or so, I got an out-of-the-blue email from Aberdeen, North Carolina, asking me if I would uh, help. And I used the term consultant, but the, it was, that's a, just a nice thing to say. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative sense because I, I just want to be helpful. 
Yeah. Uh, they are. They have a library down there. It was built in 1907. Uh, the building was built in 1907. First uh, public library um, in place in Moore County, North Carolina. And uh, this same building has been in use con continually since 1907. Um, and it is uh, the, the need of the community has outgrown the facility. So uh, a local community group has uh, acquired another building, also historically ancient, and want to um, turn it into uh, an extension of or a new uh, public library. And basically, we have a, a blank slate to work from. Oh, wow. And they sent me their thinking and some pictures of the place and asked if I would advise them in some mm -hmm. fashion. Um, so I saw that I, I wasn't the best advisor for some of their questions, but I knew people who might be. Uh, so I engaged one of our alums, who is a, a, a librarian in, in Wake County, who actually participated in the uh, development of a particular library in Wake County with the architect. And one of our new students is in the class that Megan and I both teach, um, who actually got an undergraduate degree in architecture and asked them if they would like to be a part, and they did. They, they would like to be a part of that. So the, the point here is that um, we have the opportunity to um, be of assistance to a community that's trying to do something for themselves. And we want to do that to the best of our ability without being bossy or uh, suggesting that they're not doing it right. We, we want to be as useful as we can. But what Megan was talking about led me to back to my, my doctoral research was on public libraries in this particular county. And there's so much embedded knowledge in smaller communities everywhere, but particularly here because we're living in North Carolina, of people who have oral histories, if you will, that have not been captured. But in the public, uh, the local history uh, collections of these small libraries, there is priceless information that is not really known very often. Uh, during my research uh, time, uh, people in these small libraries offered me the opportunity to look through their local history collections, and I saw stuff in them that I'd never seen anywhere else. As far as I know, it might never exist anywhere else. And uh, they were you know, generous enough to, to want me to... Uh, see it and to use it as I, I saw fit. But it, it just, it kind of remains there. And uh, if we can find a way to um, be a bridge to help them um, with their local histories to make their local history broader history so that more people know it. And again, leading back to Megan's thing and, and your question as well, that question about there not being much of a historical record of an event in the past. Uh, on, on, in my doctoral research, I started in the State Library looking for um, the records of the North Carolina Public Library Commission through the majority of the 20th century. And during periods of times when there were things that um, the community did not, was not in total agreement with, or uh, found in some fashion uh, unpleasant to discuss. It's not that they actively suppressed anything, it's just they passively didn't mention it. Mm. So the, the question of actively suppressing information is one, but not mentioning it, and you end up in the same place, there is no historical yeah. record. Right. Uh, so one would think that this is 1954. There, there might have been some discussion about this, but there isn't. And, and you know, they, the people probably, in, in their best sense, thought about we could discuss this, but it makes us feel bad or, you know, for whatever reason, we, we just don't wish to, and we're going to go on to something else. And then that seems to be all that happened. Anyway, so I, I'm kind of hoping that we get the opportunity and following along with your thing about uh, practicums, get students involved in this of picking or working with a local library, Aberdeen would be a great place uh, to um, assist them in telling their story as they wish to have their story told and thereby adding to the collective understanding of all of us about the world, in this case of the evolution of public libraries in small towns in North Carolina. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's that's the 
that's the thing that's in the front of my mind right now. And Megan's discussion really kicked me into thinking more about it. Um, so, yeah, no, that's fascinating. What a wonderful opportunity, both for you and for uh, um, the possibly getting some students involved. Yeah. Um, to, to have that sort of, um, again, I don't want to use the word consulting because that has all sorts of uh, ramifications for a, a colleague in this yeah, process. That's what I hope. Um, Honestly, thinking, I, I think the reason they asked me to do this is that my dissertation wrote about their library. Yep. And the reason I was able to write about their library is they gave me access to stuff. And the reason they gave me access to stuff is I lived in the next town. I was right. not a researcher from Chapel Hill. Right. I was a neighbor from the next town. Right. And there was a different dynamic in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that, and that dynamic is hugely important in terms of um, the, what information communities are willing to share, with whom they are willing to collaborate, um, you know, the, the, the sense of trust that is built. Um, and, and going back to the things that Megan was saying about, you know, making sure that the information remains under the control of the community, right? It's housed there, it's, it's sponsored there, and, and it's theirs. Um, I think that's really important. Um, how do you bring this community knowledge? You know, you were, you were talking about the community knowledge that is rich and, and deep. Um, how do you bring that to bear on in particular, this issue of, of the, the new library design. Um, mm. And how does that, because your, your, your website uh, says that you have this sort of user-centered design interest as well. And your teaching crosses really um, broad boundaries and, or not even boundaries, but um, covers a lot of space. Um, mm. how, how do you see the user-centered design and the sort of the, the community knowledge those two coalescing? You know, it, it gets back to the thing of uh, defining in an appropriate fashion who the users are and how the users um, appreciate the environment and, and trying to suppress your own um, human instinct to say, I know what they need mm -hmm. and trying to... Um, allow them to express themselves in such fashion that you can perhaps suggest on occasion another another facet to look at the problem through and that maybe they can um, come to a different understanding of what their environment is without, without being overbearing in the process. But it gets back to that design thing is that we have a world of design out here that is perfect for the person who designed it and not so perfect for the person who has to use it. <laughs> uh, and that can be a product design. It can be uh, an information design. It can be a website. It can be a, a document for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. But it, it really worked for the person who did it. But the, the person who's trying to use it, it's not working quite so well for. So the whole thing about user-centered design is the user understanding the question they have in the context that they have it and then trying to use the um, abilities and knowledge that you have to uh, develop something that, that works for them and for the greater populace at large mm -hmm. and it's 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 a constant 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 challenge um, I, I recently saw uh, a beautiful public library that has been rebuilt, a, a new building, it's leagues better than it had been before. They had quite a bit of funding to, to do it. It took years to do. And it, it, it's spectacular. It, it's totally wonderful. But there are physical aspects about it that make more sense to an architect than they do to every member of the user community. Right. Um, beautiful flowing staircases were great until I had to walk up to them with my arthritic knees that they were not as I had to I had to have a, a handrail to be safe on it I couldn't be in the middle of that, that huge staircase with no handrails with my knees yeah uh, and that's not to say anybody's bad it's just to say this is one user folks <laughs> right. so it's it's a mindset as much as anything else yeah mm -hmm. 
Okay. So um, in, in our classes, we try to get that mindset across uh, that we we have we bring to the um, the conversation certain abilities and skills and perceptions. And uh, we need to be humble enough to um, allow the user and to help the user um, express their um, things so that we can develop something that, that works for first for the user, but hopefully for everybody else as well, too. Mm -hmm. So um, as you think about the Aberdeen Library and the, and, the, and the possible change to this new location, can you talk to us a little bit about the role of the public library in um, sort of these rural communities? Well, my, my, my whole dissertation was about why do they exist? Mm -hmm. And after a long time of, of studying their historical records uh, and talking to everybody there, they exist because the users want them to exist in the way they do exist. And for me, as a, um, as a remove to look at it, I, I might say, that's not as good as it could be. Um, but um, if those users hadn't wanted it to exist, there wouldn't be anything for me to look at to, to complain about. So um, so they're, they're out there. They're doing a good job for their communities. We can have a discussion about whether it could be done better. But... They're there, and it's because the community wants them to exist. Um, they want them to exist, mm -hmm. and, and they make them. The Aberdeen Public Library um, has just plugged along for over a hundred years, existing, and uh, one can have discussions about whether or not it's as good as it could be, or as good as it should be. The fact is, it's still there because through all the ups and downs of of the 20th century and all the rises and falls and funding and models of how you fund an organization, it exists. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Kids can still check out a book, even if the place is maybe not arguably the best environment or the collection is arguably not the best collection. It is one that exists. Yeah. So um, we're, we're running a little short on time, but I'd love to give you a, a minute here or so to, to talk about this, um, this sort of this design issue and the, and the role of public libraries. Because one of the things I've seen is that a lot of the new designs, American Libraries Magazine just had their, their new design um, feature um, issue. And you see these sort of big open spaces, flex spaces, um, bright, airy designs, lots of windows, that kind of thing. They're absolutely gorgeous buildings. Um, is, there, um, is there a trend toward that you see of public libraries moving from sort of information delivery spaces to community gathering spaces? Yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. I would say yes. And uh, I think I've mentioned this to you before that in San Antonio, Texas, and Bear County, the public, one part of the public library has no books. Uh, mm -hmm. It is simply an information transmission space. But the place where that was put, that's exactly what that community needs, more than uh, a big historical collection of, of information books. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do believe that is uh, a current direction. It's not going to be perfect for every community, but it is, it is a current direction. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the how that the role of public libraries in communities uh, changes as we as we move into the future. Well, Ron, we're out of time, so um, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And, um, we will segue into our next panelist. Okay, I think. Hello, Helen. How are you My today? Advice. Good, good. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Um, Dr. Helen Thibault, would you tell us about yourself, please? Introduce All yourself. right. So I have been here a, um, a while. This is starting my 34th year. I came in uh, July of 1989. Um, way on the way back, I taught uh, 
uh, library reference and resourcing in Google. And um, in years uh, uh, a bit more recently, probably from the mid 90s, I have been teaching archives. We used to have one archive class that met every week. Uh, and, and we had uh, 15 students in the class. And today we have 80 students who designated that they're in the archives back. So amazing growth in that. And uh, I did my doctorate at uh, University of Maryland in uh, library information science. And I did a master's there in American studies. And I did my MLS at Indian. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I, before we get started and in, in just sort of the questions, I did want to say congratulations on uh, receiving that Society of American Archivists Council Exemplary Service Award in 2020. Um, I think that, you know, it was right in the middle of COVID. And so it probably didn't get the kind of, uh, you, you didn't get the, the notoriety that you deserved out of that award. <laughs> notoriety! So, uh, right. Um, so, um, congratulations yeah. on that. So, so thank you, and, and that's actually a very interesting story. So, uh, Beth Yankel is uh, at Michigan, and I believe is becoming the dean, and Wendy Duff is now the dean at uh, University of Toronto, and I worked on um, Mellon-funded, IMS-funded project uh, looking at user assessment, user uh, evaluation, and um, back in the early 2000s, and nobody was really interested in hearing what we were saying today is true. And we were trying to get people to do these studies and, and keep this data, and, and nobody appreciated this back in the day. But now SAA has a committee that looks at many of these same issues today, right? That's yeah. constant in there. Uh, organization now, and somebody must have said, hey, Helen, uh, Beth, and Wendy will have talking about this 20 years ago, close to 15 or something like that. Yeah. So um, it, was, it was recognition that took a while to come, but as we were talking about earlier this morning, uh, sometimes impact uh, takes a while to uh, appear. That's like, right. We don't always know what I will what impact ever. Yeah, certainly, certainly in this uh, discipline in academics, um, sometimes you just simply don't know what your impact is. Um, you know. and then out of the blue, somebody acknowledges you in a way that says, oh, okay, I touched those people or I made a difference. And yeah, that, that, and it was like, I opened that envelope and I said, damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so you, you said you... Yeah, you said you've been at, uh, at SILS and it, for a while, and you've been in archives and sort of digital curation, more recently digital curation, but curation uh, for a long time. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you have seen the archives and digital curation world change over time? Well, sure. When I started out digital curation, that came in from around 2003. Um, from the UK, maybe maybe the first use was 2001, but people really were probably using it yet. Uh, there's a digital curation center in the UK, and I think the call for bids for funding that uh, in 2001. Um, when I started teaching, there was very little talk of anything that was uh, digital, mm -hmm. right? It was essentially keeping paper. And the first students we had, of course, that's what they wanted to do because, and that was the world around them, right? Mm -hmm. So slowly the archival bureau has changed and slowly the students changed right along. I think fairly well in step in what you were actually saying. Uh, now, big uh, archives with, with strong budgets started working in, in taking care of digital content and making content digital and accessible over time. Uh, early 
earlier than small places, and many small places still only have. Um, many people think digitization is preservation. It is not. When you digitize a piece of paper, now you have a piece of paper that you need to preserve if you want to keep it. Many times you do. So you want to preserve that, and you have an electronic item, a, a digital item, that now you have to preserve that, which is actually frequently a harder pr problem than this problem. So now you have two new problems. Because taking all the money and the time and the effort to digitize doesn't produce long-term digital preservation. So in the early 2000s, the notion of digital curation arose, <coughs> which is really just like any other sort of curation. We use that word all over the place. Um, taking care of that digital content from its production from a cradle to the content creator, maybe an archivist or a, a digital curator will help the content creator pick a file format or uh, they'll help them with the first kind of metadata, file naming, something of that ilk. All the way through content being appraised, brought into a collection, uh, then uh, some sort of preservation uh, activity may happen. So you might turn a Word file into a PDF, for example, as a preservation device, and then storage. And then over time, you may very well have to change that format as formats come and go, even PDF over time, right? And, and make sure that that, is, that file is still authentic and reliable compared to what it originally was. Uh, make sure the metadata is appropriate for the time. So uh, we use the Open uh, Archival Information System, OAIS, um, as one of the foundational standards behind uh, uh, digital repositories. And one of the requirements there is that the repository and the curator maintains the understandability of the content over time for its target audience. So this was originally developed for people with space data, actually, the NASA type people. So they wouldn't expect you and I to understand space data uh, files because we couldn't understand them today. So 50 years from now, we're still not going to be able to understand them. But they would expect space scientists of 50 years from now to be able to understand them, mm -hmm. right? And you can think um, they were not thinking about this when they developed um, OAIS, but you can, you can kind of apply that principle to uh, not just understanding, but appropriateness. Um, when you start to look at reparative description and finding aids, how have to go back in and change things over time and how you described it. And although we think we're doing a swell job doing that now, I bet in another 50 years, those descriptions will have to be changed again. Now, that's an ongoing, that's part of a curriculum all the way. And you hope somebody uses the content. This is why you keep it right. We hope somebody uses it, turns it into another object that goes back into the repository and it goes around in this. Um, a circular model. Yeah. So is there, is there a difference? I mean, it sounds to me as though for print objects, um, you know, clay tablets, uh, digital objects, the issues are actually quite similar because you've got the issue of mm -hmm. creation, preservation, um, access, all of that. Um, but the, the for, as the formats change, they introduce nuances of problems or challenges um, that maybe some of the others didn't have. Um, I think of, you know, a, a clay tablet with hieroglyphics on it, and you can, you can see the object because there's not an, an intermediary, right? There's, there's not right. a technology between right. you and the object. Um, where as soon as you digitize that, then you're reliant on a computer that can access and render that that digital object, right? 
So that mediated, that sense of a mediated object becomes um, a challenge that the original object didn't have. Is that, am I right there? Yes, and it becomes more complex. I mean, now you have to have a computer, right? And you have to have electricity and you have to understand how the files work and how you're storing them and all of those things. So there's a technical side to it. And there's a community linguistic side in the use of the metadata, right? So mm -hmm. um, just the fact that um, uh, you've hidden the content when you put it in sense yeah. because well, it's digital, right? So you have to have a, a way in, and that's your description, right? So for a book, you know, a little tiny descriptive description, uh, library catalog entries, of the building. and that, and somewhat easy to create because a book is a self-contained unit with a title page. Archival collections are never. Right, they have boxes and boxes of stuff that can be quite disparate in right, somebody's collection. So, um, really, the description for me is one of the key uh, parts of uh, both the usage and how the users understand the content, usage, availability, understanding, um, and access into the collection. That that um, they call finding in in the archival, yeah. And that and then you will still have a catalog. If that's small. Finding aid could be fifty pages. So and on the size of the collection. Um. So there's a lot more curation because of the type of material than you would see for a given book. If you think about a library. The librarians are curating that entire collection. Again, they're phrasing it again, they're describing, they're marking it with uh, cataloging a tag, they're putting it on a shelf, they're controlling the thermostat, all of those things. It's really analogous, but it's more controlled in a way because the objects are really self describing and, and well behaved, as opposed to archival collections that are almost never well behaved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and you, I, I found it really interesting that you said digitization is not equi equivalent to preservation. Yeah. Um, and so my, my, my feeling is that a lot of uh, archives and, and libraries have digitized content to try and improve access, right? Not as a preservation technique, but as an access technique. And then I wonder whether um, as an access technique, without what you were talking about, the digital preservation, we make it immediately accessible to people who have internet and, and, and the technologies and the visualization techniques and everything else. But what about long-term? I mean, if, if we don't preserve these things, if we don't adapt them or change them into new formats as the old formats become obsolete, I think of VHS tape or you know eight track tapes or all of these, data points that have been upgraded or, or changed platforms, right, into, um, into CDs. And then the CDs are now going obsolete because we're streaming the music instead. So it's now all cloud storage. And then what happens when cloud storage changes to something else? So all along the way, we are taking these original data and we're upgrading or changing the formats to try and keep pace with this right. sort of churn of technology. So, and that costs a lot of money along the way. Yeah. So, any library archive project where you are digitizing something is going to cost you a good deal of money. It's not, it's not really far these days because we know about um, what the resolution should be in the things, but it's, it's somebody's got to do it. And, uh, if you don't preserve that content, then you end up wasting that money. And digital formats don't suffer benign neglect willingly or easily or gladly. The yeah. um, paper, if it was dark and dry and whatnot, would stay for a long time. Uh, so Gary and I were looking 
um, project with the codifier in the statutes of North Carolina. We're talking with somebody about that. And um, he said, well, we, have, we have snapshots of these records on the long, uh, um, on, a, on CDs, right? 20 years of CDs. And, um, but they're not complete. Like, they don't have all of them. And they're at this slice of time, like January 1st. And you know, in 20 years, there are different practices, naming conventions, describing conventions, the whole thing, right? How they took the, the images and the file formats and, and all of that that you'd somehow have to reconcile if you wanted to take that content from but actually be easier, I think, to take and re-digitize all of the, the paper so that you would know what you have. Right, right. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you, Helen, for joining us. We're out of time. Um, so I'll, I'll say, again, thank you very much for, for sharing your ideas there with our audience. And um, that, uh, that concludes our Ask Me Anything for today. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists one last time for, for joining us. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for, for being here and sharing this time with us. And we hope to see you back again at our next Ask Me Anything.